This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi there, it's Vikram Karnik with the University of Calgary and the Neurology Podcast. On this week's featured article interview podcast, I'm speaking with Kate Wyman. Kate is a clinical neuropsychologist and clinician investigator at the Health Partners Struthers Parkinson Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She's also the lead author of an article published in Neurology Clinical Practice titled Distinguishing Prodromal Dementia with Lewy Bodies from Prodromal Alzheimer's Disease, a Longitudinal Study. In this study, Kate and her collaborators conducted a longitudinal study looking at factors that can help clinicians distinguish between Alzheimer's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies based on prodromal symptoms alone. Kate, welcome to the podcast and thank you for taking the time to join us. Hi, thank you so much for the invitation. I actually completed my neuropsychology fellowship at the University of Virginia and had the opportunity to work with the late and great Ted Byrne. So this is really exciting to be here today. That's awesome. Before we get into the details of this study, I'm really just hoping to hear your big picture message. Tell us what neurologists need to know about the differences between prodromal dementia with Lewy bodies and prodromal Alzheimer's disease and why distinguishing between these two conditions early on is important. We know from clinicopathological studies that DLB is underrecognized and therefore underdiagnosed in clinical practice. And studies focused on the lived experiences of individuals with DLB tell us that patients have been evaluated by two to three different specialists prior to receiving a diagnosis. And in fact, many of those individuals were initially diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. An accurate diagnosis really is imperative for disease management, but also patient and caregiver education and planning. So if we can identify more reliable signs and symptoms that help us differentiate between DLB and AD, that's going to help clinicians arrive at the correct diagnosis at an early stage. And we know early detection is also incredibly important now that we're in this new era of disease-modifying therapies. So we recognize that individuals with neurodegenerative disease can experience symptoms such as cognitive, motor, autonomic, neuropsychiatric symptoms prior to meeting criteria for dementia. So we really sought to identify which clinical features best differentiate prodromal DLB from early stage Alzheimer's disease. And according to the 2017 McKeith consensus criteria, the core clinical features of DLB include Parkinsonism, visual hallucinations, cognitive fluctuations, and REM sleep behavior disorder, or as I'll refer to it, RBD. The data from this North American cohort really suggests that one or more core clinical features, including those motor symptoms, are present at least two years prior to a diagnosis of DLB. We also found that neuropsychological assessment can help us differentiate between mild cognitive impairment with Lewy bodies and MCI due to Alzheimer's disease. These cognitive profiles really do mirror what we see in DLB and Alzheimer's disease, but not surprisingly, to a lesser degree of severity. So in 2020, McKeith and colleagues published research guidelines for prodromal DLB, but additional research is needed to validate and further refine that criteria for clinical use. The results of our study are similar to those that have been investigated in other cohorts, including those from England, Japan, Australia, and the Netherlands. But one of the strengths of our study is the use of the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center Uniform Data Set, also known as the NAC UDS. And what this is, is over 30 Alzheimer's disease research centers across the U.S. have collected a high volume of data longitudinally. So thousands of individuals without cognitive impairment have enrolled in this study, presumably as healthy controls. But unfortunately, we know that some of those individuals are going to develop a neurodegenerative condition. So through this large data set, we were able to identify study participants who entered the study without a diagnosis of dementia, but were eventually diagnosed with either DLB or Alzheimer's disease. So not surprisingly, the presence of mild cognitive impairment and two or more of the core features of DLB, so hallucinations, RBD, Parkinsonism, and, and fluctuations in cognition, were the strongest predictors of progression to dementia with Lewy bodies. I'd like to delve into the sleep issues a little bit more, though. So it wasn't just symptoms of frank RBD that were reported more frequently in the DLB group. Is that right? 
That's right. We found that sleep disturbances or nighttime behaviors, which were really defined as waking up too early, waking during the night, or even excessive naps during the day, were endorsed by 50% of individuals with DLB up to two years prior to a dementia diagnosis. And this was compared to 20% in the Alzheimer's group. We believe that this information is going to offer an opportunity for clinicians to engage in early interventions such as cognitive behavioral treatment for insomnia. But we also found that RBD was the strongest predictor of a subsequent DLB diagnosis. And in fact, the 2020 prodromal research criteria state that RBD has been established as the best prodromal feature for predicting conversion to DLB. A recent meta-analysis conducted by our colleague Paul Donaghy from Newcastle University also found RBD and Parkinsonism were the most common symptoms among those with MCI with Lewy bodies. Of course, we know RBD is also a prodromal symptom of Parkinson's disease and multiple system atrophy, and the clinical heterogeneity in these synucleinopathies really complicates our ability to predict where someone might be headed. But if we see deficits in attention, executive functioning, and visual spatial abilities, for example, within the context of idiopathic RBD, we do think that these individuals may be on the path towards DLB, particularly within the context of minimal or absent Parkinsonism or autonomic symptoms. Polysomnography or structured, well-validated questionnaires assessing RBD may be helpful in clinical practice in ruling out some of those RBD mimics, which can include, of course, periodic limb movement disorder, trauma-associated sleep disorders, or even non-REM sleep parasomnias. And since we are focusing specifically on core features right now, I do think it is important to take a moment to highlight that it's not necessary to experience visual hallucinations or demonstrate Parkinsonism on exam in order to meet criteria for DLB. This is a common misunderstanding, uh, and individuals with dementia who have two or more core clinical features meet the criteria for probable DLB. So this can include a combination of RBD and cognitive fluctuations, for example. Thanks so much, Kate. So the DLB group reported higher rates of anxiety, apathy, delusions, and hallucinations relative to the AD group. I'm wondering if this data is consistent across other cohort studies of these neuropsychiatric symptoms, particularly with recent publications using criteria for mild behavioral impairment. Yeah, there are several neuropsychiatric symptoms which are actually considered supportive diagnostic features of DLB, and these include apathy, anxiety, depression, but also hallucinations in non-visual modalities, for example, auditory hallucinations. People can also have very specific delusions, including the belief that a loved one has been replaced by an imposter who is often an identical duplicate, and some may even experience delusional jealousy or the belief that their partner is unfaithful. I briefly mentioned the 2020 McKeith prodromal research criteria, but I think this would be a good time to discuss that the authors propose three prodromal phenotypes. The first one is the one that I think we're all most familiar with and has the largest volume of research. So this is going to be the cognitive impairment onset or mild cognitive impairment with Lewy bodies. Another phenotype is characterized by recurrent and prolonged episodes of delirium. And the third is the psychiatric onset, which may or may not be accompanied by cognitive impairment. So the psychiatric symptoms can precede cognitive impairment for several years. And these symptoms can include depression, apathy, and anxiety, but in some cases can also include catatonia and psychosis. For some, the symptoms can be severe enough to warrant hospitalization. In our study, participants who developed DLB did report higher rates of depression, apathy, and anxiety, about 43%, relative to those who were later diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So that was around 26%. And this was two years prior to a dementia diagnosis. 14% of the DLB group endorsed some form of hallucinations, while none of the participants with Alzheimer's disease reported these symptoms. 
At the first visit with a dementia diagnosis, 36% of those with DLB endorsed hallucinations relative to 3.5% of the participants with Alzheimer's disease. And similar rates have been found in other prodromal cohorts. I believe that these findings provide further evidence that there's an early emergence of neuropsychiatric symptoms in those who go on to develop DLB. We know that visual hallucinations are a core feature, but in the early stages of DLB, something that we call minor hallucinations are actually more common. So this is going to include things like passage illusions, which is the perception of a shadow moving quickly out of the corner of someone's eye, visual misperceptions, which can be described as the brief perception that maybe clothes hanging in the closet or a stop sign, for example, are somebody standing there, but then they do a double take and recognize the object for what it is. And some patients can also experience what we call extra campine hallucinations, which is the sense of presence when they're the only one in the room. Other prodromal studies have suggested that these well-formed hallucinations occur in up to 25% of individuals with prodromal DLB, but the minor hallucinations can occur in up to 65% of cases. So this is something that's really important to assess in clinical practice. Let's move to motor symptoms now and pick apart that data a little bit. So we saw that motor slowing was seen in 70% of participants up to two years prior to progression to DLB. However, no single motor symptom was sensitive or specific enough to distinguish DLB and AD. Can you get into this data a little bit for us and explain why no single motor symptom was sensitive or specific enough? You know, Parkinsonism occurs in up to 85% of individuals with DLBs. So again, to the point that the presence of Parkinsonism is not required to meet criteria. In fact, many folks with DLB who demonstrate Parkinsonism don't meet full criteria for Parkinson's disease. So only one of the cardinal features is sufficient to fulfill that criteria. And motor slowing and gait instability appear to be more common than tremor in prodromal DLB. We know that slowed movements and tremor can occur in healthy adults as part of aging. So it's really, really important to take care to avoid misinterpreting physical symptoms like arthritis, neuropathy, or even the use of antidopaminergic medications as they're doing their assessments. In our study, we did find that motor slowing was the most common symptom, but it also was fairly common in up to 25% of those with Alzheimer's disease. Tremor was present in 40% of the DLB group and only 8% of the Alzheimer's group. But it's important to note that NAC does not specify the nature of the tremor. So we really don't know if it's a rest tremor, if it's oscillatory, if it's a kinetic tremor. So this motor slowing and tremor may not represent Parkinsonism, for example. That is a limitation. In the real world, unfortunately, copathology is something that we see relatively frequently in clinical practice. Does this kind of muddy the waters a little bit in terms of predicting how things will go? And how do you suggest we reconcile this in future studies? You're absolutely right. And there are many people who can speak to this better than I can. But copathology tends to be the rule rather than the exception. And we know at least half of the individuals with DLB have AD-related pathological changes on autopsy. And this has important clinical implications because at times we're really focused on identifying the diagnosis instead of seeing the full clinical picture and the fact that there may be multiple diagnoses. There is some evidence to suggest that among those with copathology, the likelihood of that typical DLB phenotype is higher with those who have more severe Lewy body pathology, whereas the likelihood of this typical DLB phenotype decreases with the severity of the Alzheimer's pathology. So in other words, there's a possibility that the DLB core features may be quote unquote masked by the Alzheimer's pathology. It's unclear how often clinicians are using these multimodal biomarkers in clinical practice, but sometimes the neuropsychological profile will reflect an amnestic profile among individuals who do have those clinical features of DLB, and so that may be suggestive of copathology. This is important to identify because copathology can be an indicator of more rapid cognitive decline and a shorter disease course. So to your question about future studies, as someone involved in several clinical trial working groups, I can say there's a lot of discussion 
regarding the use of these multimodal biomarker panels to aid in the investigation of these new disease-modifying therapies among those with evidence of co-pathology. So stay tuned. (laughs) Thanks, Kate. I appreciate it. Um, To wrap up uh, today's podcast, I'm just wondering if you can tell me how this study has changed your clinical practice. Are you approaching patients differently? Are you potentially disclosing diagnoses earlier? Or do you think there's just a bit more work to be done before we change how we practice? My view is that patients and families are coming to us because they're seeking answers. I believe that this timely and accurate diagnosis is going to help us guide appropriate management, education, and support. But I also recognize that this can be a very heavy diagnosis for patients and families. It would not be, I guess, unreasonable for clinicians to continue to monitor symptoms until they have enough evidence to provide that diagnosis. The clinical criteria for prodromal DLB are just around the corner. So when those are established, this may also help clinicians to have something to point to when they're having these discussions with patients. Clinically speaking, if I'm concerned but somewhat uncertain, I will have a frank conversation about the cognitive strengths and weaknesses with the patient. If the patient meets criteria for MCI, I often explain that there are some symptoms that we're going to want to monitor over time and that we can't rule out that there may be something neurodegenerative that is beginning to express itself. In my clinical documentation, I'll often write that there's concern for a neurodegenerative condition and list those symptoms, but I'm never going to document Lewy body or synucleinopathy in the patient's chart unless I have strong suspicions and that I've had that conversation with the patient. And if there is an amnestic profile, I will write that there is concern for dual pathology. In those cases of uncertainty, the patients and families really are seeking more information. I work closely with the medical team to to see if biomarkers may or may not be helpful. Dopamine transporter imaging is considered an indicative biomarker of DLB positive scan, and it's commonly used in our community-based hospital system, so I'm not in an academic medical center. However, a negative scan does not exclude the possibility of DLB, even among those with dementia, and that's an important clinical take-home. As I've learned more about early symptoms, I've certainly adapted my clinical interview to include more detailed information or questions about those minor hallucinations. And we may not think about asking patients who are working or those who have few cognitive concerns about zoning out, episodes of delirium, episodes of confusion. So sometimes I will use some brief standardized questionnaires that are specifically developed to assess for symptoms of cognitive fluctuations and minor hallucinations, for example. The Mayo Clinic has several scales that can be helpful in this regard. So a couple other points. Clinically, it can be hard to assess those visual spatial abilities in a clinical interview. That is one of the cognitive domains that is often impacted. So in the clinical interview, I'll ask about difficulty parking between the lines, judging distance, depth perception with stairs, for example. And of course, I'll objectively assess these skills, well-validated neuropsych measures. But to your final question, I'll say that there is a lot of work to do. Very, very little is known regarding DLB, let alone prodromal DLB, among individuals who are from diverse ethnic and racial backgrounds. I will say that we still have a lot of work to do, and very little is known regarding DLB, let alone prodromal DLB, among individuals who are from diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds. We don't have a good understanding of the rates of underdiagnosis or co-pathology, for example. From a global perspective, there really is a lack of data from South America and Africa, but efforts are underway to promote this research through partnering with international institutions, and we're working on the development of a harmonized global research protocol. I'd say ultimately, our goal is really to improve early and accurate identification of this disease through an increased understanding of these early clinical symptoms. Thank you, Kate. We really appreciate your time today. Once again, I've been speaking with Dr. Kate Wyman, a clinical neuropsychologist and clinician scientist at Health Partners Struthers Parkinson Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, about her group's paper titled Distinguishing Prodromal Dementia with Lewy Bodies from Prodromal Alzheimer's Disease, a Longitudinal Study. Please check out the paper recently published on October 8, 2024 in Neurology Clinical Practice, and have a great week. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. 
And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, where you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.